right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to start you. The microphone's a little loud. If you're, if you're still outside, you're welcome to, to come in, too. Um, so welcome to one of our Thursday night programs here at the Figgy Art Museum. Uh, my name is Joshua Johnson. I'm an assistant curator here at the museum. Um, I am just so glad to be able to welcome you all here in person after a year of virtual events. It's so nice to see everyone and have everyone here and be able to experience the ex exhibitions in person as they were intended. Um, as many of you know, we have one of these free Thursday night programs almost every Thursday, um, and that is in thanks uh, and thanks in part to the generosity of Chris and Mary Rayburn, who sponsor these programs. And so to Chris and Mary Rayburn, we are so thankful. Uh, if you're interested in continuing on and going to these programs, we actually will be hosting one next Thursday, where myself and the rest of the curatorial team will be giving an act a walkthrough tour of the Urban Exposure Exhibition, which you all had to walk through to get to the uh, auditorium tonight. It's in the Cats Gallery. Uh, so come back for that. It'll be at 6.30 at the same time. And of course, those are always free. Um, as I mentioned, these are free. But if you are you know, interested in the programming and what we do here, I very much encourage you to become a member here at the Figgy Art Museum. Membership not only supports wonderful programming like this, but also helps support the educational programming, the care of the collection, and all the rotating exhibitions that we do at the museum. Um, so as I mentioned, Chris and Rayburn are, Mary Rayburn are the sponsors of tonight's program. But I also need to thank the program sponsors for the exhibition in its whole. Um, so we have uh, Humanities Iowa as one of the major exhibition sponsors for this evening's program and for the exhibition. As you will have all noticed, there's a pack of uh, program reviews or program evaluations at the table as you all walked in. I invite you, if you didn't pick one up on your way in, to pick one up on your way out and just fill it out briefly. It does really help us in terms of evaluating this program and helping Humanities Iowa to see what good uh, work they're all doing. Uh, so please fill that out and you can leave it on the table there or you can hand it to me personally. Uh, the other exhibition sponsors were the Modern, Modern Women of America and the Carolyn Levine and Leonardo Kaleo Trust. So for all of those exhibition sponsors, we are so, so very grateful they help make exhibitions like this possible. Uh, for tonight's program, we very much welcome any questions that, that you in the audience might have. Uh, we just ask that you kind of hold on to them. I know you'll be burning with uh, questions, but hold on to them to the end and uh, Dr. Cunning will prompt you as to when you can kind of enter the participatory part of the program. Um, Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cunning as well as artist Anne Lindbergh and poet Ginny Threefoot. Uh, Anne and Ginny collaborated on the exhibition on the fourth floor, uh, which you can all see in the lovely slide here. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to see it yet in person, I very much encourage you to do so. There's only about two weeks left. It ends on September 4th, so please come back and see that. Um, but Tonight, they will be discussing the philosophical connections between the Think Like a River exhibition and the ideas that are explored within it, and the work of the 17th century philosopher and scientist Margaret Cavendish. Um, Dr. Cunning is actually an expert on Margaret Cavendish and is a professor of philosophy at the University of Iowa. His research and te teaching interests include the history of mo the mind-body problem, the methods of rationalism, free will and determinism, agency, and the rhetoric of inquiry. Uh, Dr. Cunning recently completed a scholarly edition of the works of Margaret Cavendish, and who we will be discussing this evening. Uh, David's ongoing research continues to focus on Cavendish as well as Descartes. Uh, he has published several books and many articles relating to Descartes, including in the series, The Rutledge Philosophers. Uh, and as previously mentioned, he recently edited Margaret Cavendish's philosophical writings for the Oxford University Press. Um, he also published uh, Cavendish in the series, The Arguments of the Philosophers, amongst many other articles and books. Uh, artist Anne Lindbergh and Ginny Threefoot will be joining us virtually this evening after Dr. Cunning's lecture. Uh, so you'll see them as kind of a Wizard of Oz presence on the screen here, the kind of people behind the curtain. Um, so they'll be here a little bit later in the program. Uh, but Anne Lindbergh's work has been exhibited widely throughout the United States and abroad, including at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, uh, the Museum of Arts and Design, and many other fine institutions. Uh, her work is included in the permanent collections of the Nevada Museum of Art, the Detroit Institute of Art, the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art, and another list along that we couldn't possibly get through all of them this evening. 
Uh, Anne Lindbergh earned her MFA from the Cranbrook Academy of Art and a BFA from the Miami University. She now lives in Akrondale, New York, but she did grow up nearby here in Iowa City. Uh, she's, so she's basically a local. We'll claim her as one of our own. Um, poet Ginny Threefoot received her MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop. So again, another nearby connection in Iowa City. Uh, her work has appeared or is forthcoming in the Bennington Review, the Caliban, the Cincinnati Review, the Cream City Review, Poet Lore, Poet Daily, and many other publications that are upcoming or are either current. Um, this is actually the fourth collaboration between uh, Anne Lindbergh and Ginny Threefoot, um, and they've had many other exhibitions together at Carrie Seacrest as well as Hawk Contemporary. Um, and of course, the fine thing like a river exhibition on the, on the fourth floor. I know the elevator's out. I do encourage you to kind of brave that hike after the uh, talk tonight if you haven't already. It's really worth seeing in person. The photographs, lovely as they are, do not do it justice. Uh, without any further ado or kind of blabbering from me, I'm more than happy to turn things over to Dr. Cunning. Dr. Cunning, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming. Uh, so Cavendish would be floored that we're, that that a group is here to think about her work uh, about 350 years after she wrote. Uh, this is this is really exciting. I'm grateful that that you all are here. Uh, so uh, uh, Margaret Cavendish, uh, she was a Duchess of Newcastle uh, and an English philosopher, scientist, and writer who lived from 1623 to 1673. She wrote and published eight philosophical monographs, depending on how you count. But the scholars agree that it's about eight. And she also wrote and published poetry, plays, and science fiction. She expected that her contemporaries would not read her work or take it seriously in the 1650s through 1670s or so. And so she made sure to send all of it to prominent libraries to increase the chance that future generations might give it a fair hearing. It's thrilling in the 21st century to see that she's getting the attention that she so rightly deserves. And it's really an honor to be here to share some of her ideas with you today. One of the themes that's central to the work of Cavendish is that there's a kind of mentality and intelligence and mindedness uh, in nature. It's ubiquitous in nature, it's everywhere she thinks, uh, if we would only take the time to notice it. Her work fits very nicely into the Think Like the River exhibit. Cavendish would say that the river indeed thinks and that in a lot of respects, it's wiser than, than any human being. First, I'd like to say a few words about some of the connections that I see between the work of Cavendish and the work of Anne Lindbergh and Ginny Threefoot. And please do see the exhibit again, if you haven't had a chance, it's outstanding. One connection to Anne Lindbergh's wonderful art has to do with the theme that there is vitality and energy in spaces that we do not notice even if it just needs to be exposed, but the energy and vitality are already there. Uh, her, her thread installations make that exposure happen, showing us air and light and microscopic bodies that lie between each thread, but that otherwise would go unseen. When I first saw the installation here at the Figgy, I looked around for the extra lighting that I assumed had been installed in the room and that made everything so visible, but there wasn't any extra lighting. It was just the installation itself that lit up the room. And this is a pattern across a lot of the different exhibits that, that Anne Lindbergh has done. One connection to Ginny Threefoot's wonderful poem is the idea that the vitality and energy that we overlook is in some cases a kind of mentality or mindedness. For both Cavendish and Threefoot, the river exhibits a kind of intelligence and wisdom, literally, an intelligence and wisdom from which we have a lot to learn. So Cavendish holds that mentality is ubiquitous in nature and intelligence are ubiquitous in nature. To lay out her view, we might start with an obvious assumption that she makes, that we human beings exhibit uh, mentality and intelligence, at least sometimes. Uh, we think and plan and have ideas, that seems uncontroversial. But then Cavendish argues that if we think about it, mentality spans the spectrum of non-human creatures as well. All the way down, she's gonna argue to cells and element, what she calls elemental bodies. But, but cells and atoms and such. So first, or she cites what she takes to be obvious data about particular non-human animals. Uh, so she writes, this is our first passage. Uh, the knowledge of other creatures many times gives information to, the, to humans. 
as for example, the Egyptians are informed how high the river Nile will rise by, by the crocodiles building her nest, higher or lower, which shows that those creatures foresee or foreknow more than men can do. Also, many birds foreknow the rising of a tempest and shelter themselves before it comes. The like examples might be given of several other sorts of animals. I'm from California and the dogs used to always bark just before an earthquake. And that sort of story was that maybe they're detecting something or they know something. So then Cavendish, so she supposes that, that certain uh, specific non-human animals have intelligence. Then she supposes that the same applies to insects like ants, to insects like ants and bees and spiders. Uh, in what is basically an ode to the ant, uh, she writes, um, a company of ants meeting together, uh, choose the root or bottom thereof to build the city. They build after one fashion, which is like a hill or half globe, the outside being convex, the inside concave, a figure it seems they think most lasting and least subject to ruin. They being wiser than man, no time is precious and therefore judiciously order it, forecasting while they work and taking up the whole time with contrivance. Likewise, they are careful of repairs, lest ruin should go upon them insomuch that if the least grain of dust be misplaced, they stop or close it up again. Uh, so their care and affection is not less to bury their dead. Well, according to Cavendish, uh, crocodiles and birds exhibit extremely sophisticated behavior that is guided by intelligence and mentality. So do ants and other insects. And so do other creatures that we might suppose are too primitive to think. She again supposes that cells and other microscopic creatures are mindful as well. I hear a couple of fun passages. Uh, the elemental creatures are as excellent as man, uh, the, the very small microscopic bodies that compose uh, everything else, basically the elements of the periodic table, even though they didn't quite have that yet in the 17th century. The elemental creatures are as excellent as man, and I, can't, and I, um, and, uh, I cannot perceive more abilities in man than in the rest of natural creatures. Life and knowledge is animate matter, uh, matter is just another word for body, or for physical bodies, material things, and is in all parts of all creatures. Life and knowledge is in all parts of all creatures. Uh, that's the view, at least. Right? She looks around and she thinks that it's obvious that the bodies in nature are, are smart and wise and exhibit intelligence. So she supposes that it's obvious uh, that there's knowledge and wisdom in all creatures, she looks around, she sees it, and she describes what she takes to be in front of her. But someone might, of course, object that it's only metaphorical to say that ants and spiders or cells, right, exhibit wisdom and mentality. Perhaps they're just a kind of machine and they don't have minds at all. So Cavendish makes sure to offer arguments for her contention. Uh, one especially clever argument that she offers begins with the assumption that human brains think. Right? think that's pretty straightforward and, and obvious human brains think. Uh, then she argues that the only way that human brains could think is if the elemental bodies that compose the brain, basically the neurons and then the atoms that compose the neurons, the only way that human brains could think is, is if the elemental bodies that compose the brain were also mental and perceptive. In effect, she's asking the question, if the physical elements that made up the brain are entirely non-mental, the elements that make up the brain are entirely non-mental and exhibit zero trace of mentality. How could they add up to a larger brain that thinks? If the basic elements of the brain do not have any mentality at all, then she's arguing they couldn't combine together into a larger body that thinks or does have mentality. That would be magic, right? The thinking will just kind of go poof and all of a sudden appear. And Cavendish is not gonna appeal to magic in her explanations of things. Non-mental elements, could certainly combine together, uh, non-mental, non-thinking atoms could certainly combine together to compose a larger thing that is also not mental or intelligent. But if elements combine together to form a brain that thinks, then those elements must exhibit some trace of mentality or maybe just proto-mentality, we could call it. And so she writes in a passage, uh, this is the clever argument, one of her clever arguments. I shall never be able to conceive how senseless and irrational atoms, or atoms who don't have minds basically, 
how senseless and irrational atoms could produce sense and reason, or how a sensible and rational body such as the soul is. Tis true different effects may proceed from one cause or principle, but there's no principle which is totally senseless and lacks perception and mind that can produce sensitive effects, nor no rational effects can flow from the irrational cause. In a nutshell, if atoms don't exhibit an iota of mentality, then human brains wouldn't exhibit an iota of mentality either, but human brains do exhibit mentality. Therefore, the smallest elemental bodies that compose the brain exhibit mentality as well. The atoms that make up the brain have electrons and protons. Those are kinds of standard features of atoms. Cavendish thinks they also have a kind of proto-mentality and perception. And if she were making up a periodic table, she would write hydrogen and write the number of protons and the atomic number, and then she'd write a certain amount of thinking also applies to each of the atoms as well. But Cavendish then adds, right, uh, she says, look, uh, the elements that make up the brain are many of the same bodies that compose everything else in nature. The elements that make up the brain aren't especially different from the elements that make up other bodies in nature. So that means the mentality isn't just in the brain, it's in other places in nature, it's everywhere. It's in creatures like ants, spiders, bees, crocodiles, birds, and cells. So she takes it to be obvious just from watching those kinds of creatures that they're smart. Then she offers this argument that says that elemental bodies exhibit intelligence. And since they compose all these other creatures, we shouldn't be surprised that they would exhibit intelligence as well. But note for the moment that when Cavendish says that ants and cells and elemental bodies are perceptive and that they think, she doesn't mean to say that they're conscious and reflective. She thinks that there's a kind of cognition that is very impactful, but that's below the threshold of conscious awareness. So she's not, she's not thinking that when cells think, they deliberate and debate about what to do. They, ex they engage in a different level of thinking that's still very impactful. It's, it's in many cases below the level of you know, the threshold of conscious awareness. And there's examples of this she would cite. For example, when we fall asleep thinking about a problem or puzzle and we wake up with a solution, and so cognition was clearly taking place overnight while we were asleep. Or when the fingers of an expert pianist exhibit embodied intelligence in the skillful pressing of each key, though the pianist is not paying attention to every movement, not thinking about every movement. Or when we stream through a conversation and, not con and are not conscious of each of the words that we utter, and we're not conscious of the process by which those words come to us in exactly the right order. This is just an aside, but we'll come back to it later. But Cavendish takes it to be obvious that there's mindedness and intelligence across the entire spectrum of creatures, from humans to crocodiles to ants and cells. Now I'd like to transition to her view that the knowledge and wisdom of natural bodies is in many respects superior to that of human beings. Not in all respects, but she thinks in many respects superior to that of human beings. So first she cites some of the clever and sophisticated things that non-human bodies, non-human creatures can do, but that we cannot. So she writes, I cannot perceive more abilities in human beings than in the rest of natural creatures. For though a, a man can build a stately house, yet he cannot make a honeycomb, which is a very intricate kind of thing. Though he can plant a slip, yet he cannot make a tree, but we can make a sword or knife, yet he cannot make the metal. She adds, natural reason is above artifice. Uh, that's basically uh, technology, you know, the kind of things that we make. Natural reason is above artifice. Wherefore, those arts or technologies are the best and surest informers that alter nature least, and they the greatest deluders that alter nature most. So natural reason is a kind of reason that is in uh, creatures like crocodiles and, and cells and, and spiders. And she thinks that's a kind of reason that in many cases is above the sort of thinking that we do. And if we do ever get to the point of reaching it, maybe we're just imitating it, she says. Okay. Um, so we can create a sword, uh, Cavendish thinks, uh, but we cannot create the metal that makes up a sword. Perhaps we can do it in 2022, but Cavendish would insist that if so, nature figured it out first, and we're just imitating the skill of nature and following its lead. 
There's also a sense, we, there's also a sense in which we can make a tree, but not really, Cavendish would say. We can certainly plant a shrub or what she is calling a slip in her uh, in the quoted text. When we do that, uh, we aren't really doing all the productive work. And indeed, the contribution on our end is fairly minimal. We put a seed or shrub in the ground and water it, and a tree eventually forms. All of the real work is done by the complicated genetic and physical structure of the seed or shrub. A, a seed or shrub. And if it did not have that structure, we could water the thing all day long and nothing would grow at all. Two people might also brag about how they made a baby together right, as a kind of production or achievement. But the same thing applies again. Right? The real, the real legwork is done by the sophistication of the reproductive organs and the infrastructure by which nutrition is redistributed to the growing fetus, for example, through the remarkable organ that is the placenta. A uh, human being then uh, forms, and it, and it consists of things like the human eye, uh, which again is, is remarkable. It's about as intricate an entity as could be. Uh, but that's made by natural processes, by a kind of skill that Cavendish is thinking we don't have. Uh, perhaps we've caught up to nature in some instances. For example, we can now make synthetic seeds that become plants. But again, Cavendish would insist that in such a case, we're imitating the wisdom of nature, and the nature figured it out first. But we still cannot make a human eye. We can make bionic eyes, but they're not as good as far as I understand it as human eyes. Can't make a human eye or much else that nature has been manufacturing seamlessly and skillfully for eons. So Cavendish, Cavendish accordingly concludes that nature is a lot smarter and a lot more functional than we are. And then we have this passage, natural reason is above artifice, uh, wherefore those arts are the best and surest in farmers that alter nature least follow nature's lead. If we imitate nature and do not veer from its methods, we will do well, Cavendish is supposing, otherwise not so much. Cavendish supposes that the river, uh, it's a natural creature, right? it's a natural body, that the river, and its inhabitants the river and its inhabitants exhibit mentality and wisdom along with the rest of nature. She thinks that in some instances, natural bodies are far wiser than we are. One lesson that she thinks that we have not learned in particular is that if we focus too much on our own individual self-interest, we, we actually undermine our interest and bring harm to ourselves. We become weaker by losing the supports that come with the backing of a strong community. And we also miss out on pleasures that are other directed, not just self-interested pleasures that we might enjoy. We miss out on pleasures that are directed toward, uh, toward others. So in one passage she writes, uh, this is in a great uh, piece called A Tale of the Ant and the Bee. She has stories like this, a conversation between a man and the tree, a conversation between a man and the ant. This is a tale of the ant and the bee, uh, in which she says that bees are wiser for they know that if the commonwealth be ruinated, no particular person can be free. Here's a way in which she thinks that bees are wiser than human beings. They recognize that if the, the commonwealth be broken or unstable, no person can be free. Uh, here, Cavendish is offering a partial explanation for why bees and ants are so cooperative. They're cooperative in part because they recognize that self-interest and other interests often coincide. They coincide to the point that one sometimes collapses into the other, and the distinction between self-interest and other interests can become hard to draw. She describes, for example, the interactions of the members of an ant colony. And I think the ant is probably her favorite insect just by the number of pages that she devotes to, to them. Okay, so she writes, uh, uh, Mark but the little ant, how she doth run, as if she ordered all the world's affairs, when tis but only one small straw she bears. When they find a fly which on the ground lies dead, Lord, how they stir, so full is every head. Some with their feet and mouths draw it along, others their tails and shoulders thrust it on. And if a stranger ant comes on that way, she helps them straight, never asks if she may. Their house is common, all help to build and keep in repair. No special workmen, all laborers they are. To keep in life through dangers run, to get provisions in against winter comes. In these passages and in many other passages like it, Cavendish is reflecting that ants and bees and, and similar creatures work together in ways that benefit individual and group both. 
the tenor of her language is quite different when it comes to human beings. It's, it's quite uh, cynical when, she, when it comes to human beings. Uh, so in, in two passages in particular, she writes, about self-love and, and self-interest. Self-love is the fountain of an in nature from whence issue out several springs to every several creature, wherein mankind is filled with the fullest springs from that fountain, which is the cause that mankind is more industrious, cruel and insatiable, insatiable to and for his self ends than any other creature. He spares nothing that he hath power to destroy. If he fears any hurt or hopes for any gain or finds any pleasure, or can make any sport, or to employ his idle time. He melts metals, distills and dissolves plants, dissects animals, subtracts and extracts elements. He digs up the bowels of the earth, fresh waters into mills and imprisons the thinner air. He cruelly causeth one creature to destroy one, one another. Uh, the whilst he looks on with delight, he kills not only to live, but he lives for to kill and takes pleasure in torturing the life of other creatures. Um, another much shorter passage. She says, self-love is the strongest motion of the mind, for it strives to attract all delight and gathers together like the sunbeams in one point as with a glass, it's like a central power that motivates us. Like sunbeams gathered together, or with it sets all on fire. Self-love is the tyrant which makes the state of mind, state of the mind unhappy, for it's so partially covetous that it desires more than all and is contented with nothing. So I mean, maybe, maybe this is an overstatement. Maybe she's hanging around with some of the wrong people, but you can see what she has in mind, right? It seems like there's a kind of cooperation that happens at least in some communities of non-human creatures. And she's thinking there's a, a way in which human beings often exhibit uh, opposite kinds of uh, qualities and characteristics. Uh, so in effect, she's saying there's a kind of other interest that doesn't come as naturally to us as to other creatures. Right? We're, we more have, got, are more guided by self-interest other creatures seem to be guided more like other interests. I sometimes like to think of the emperor penguin, if people have seen these, where they gather together at the North or South Pole and they'll take turns on the outermost edge of the, of the group and some, in order to uh, preserve the amount of heat that's in the center. And sometimes one of them will fall dead on the outside uh, and they just, they just do this. It keeps the community alive. It kept them alive for a really long time as well. If they unfortunately happen to perish. Um, so, so she's thinking there's a kind of other interest that doesn't come as naturally to us as to other creatures. Perhaps it's because we have the distinct ability to deliberate and imagine and plan. And in cases where we uh, fear any hurt, as she put it in the passage, or we have too much idle time, we scheme to neutralize threats to our survival. We have too much time to think and we overthink and overact and we do the bad things. Or perhaps we're just too self-interested and that's that. Uh, perhaps it's a combination of both. Uh, but Cavendish isn't saying that that's our permanent condition. It's not our permanent condition to be guided by self-interested and not as much by other interests like some of the animal creatures. Uh, we have self-interested desires, but it, of course it's possible to cultivate new desires. Uh, for example, this is a different kind of example. Cavendish doesn't talk about it, but for example, a person might have no desire to go to the gym but they might notice that they'd be better off if they did have a desire to go to the gym, right? And so they might try to cultivate that desire or develop that desire. After a few months, they have a strong desire to go to the gym and then they then enjoy being there. They get satisfaction being there. So what Kevin is suggesting, I think, is that we'd be better off if we didn't have so many self-interested desires, but instead we had more, we had a lot more other interested desires. We may not have many other interested desires right now, but we can cultivate desires and develop them. We've all heard of cases in which individuals report that they're far happy after incorporating volunteer and community activities in their life, even if they had no desire to engage in those activities in the first place. Maybe it feels like a sacrifice at first, but once these people are doing it, they're actually happy and satisfied. They're getting a lot of pleasure out of it. So why not get a lot of pleasure out of an other interested desire if it you know, helps the community and makes the community stronger? Uh, Kevin should say that as part of nature, we're all made of the same basic stuff, and we can tap into our most basic ingredients and reconfigure them to a better end. For example, we, we can develop desires that are more other interested, even if it takes some work. And then once we have those desires, we can pursue them and achieve a tremendous amount of satisfaction. We would also have more of the strength of the community behind us as a result, like some of the animal creatures. <clears throat> 
Another way that we can learn from the natural world is to imitate and cultivate the particular kind of thinking in which non-human creatures often partake. Thinking that is less deliberative and more present and in the moment. We might suppose that our reflective and deliberative ways of thinking are optimal, but often they shoot us in the foot. Right? In many cases, we think and deliberate and implement steps to avoid things that realistically will never happen, but we've been able to conjure them up and imagine them. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time deliberating and thinking of, of things that realistically will never happen. We use up a lot of time anticipating and imagining these things. Cavendish would argue that as a rule, non-human creatures don't do that. They're more in the moment, skillfully and seamlessly responding to what is in front of them and no more. The behavior of non-human non creatures is wise and intricate and sophisticated. The behavior of non-human creatures is in many cases wise and intricate and sophisticated. Cavendish thinks that in many cases, such creatures surpass us. They think, but they don't overthink. And they think in a way that maximizes the balance of the interest of the individual and the interest of the community. So Cavendish would agree that we should think like the river and in more ways than one. Thank you. And so now we'll, we'll turn, uh, the, uh, we'll bring uh, uh, Ginny and Ann into the conversation. <laughs> okay, it worked. Uh, <laughs> welcome Ginny and Ann. And I think Ginny, you were gonna start us off with the first question, is that right? Yeah. Hi, and thank you so much for introducing us to the work of Cavendish and for creating this opportunity to connect it to the exhibit. One thing I've been wondering about as I've learned from you about her thinking and our alienation from nature, our self-interest is a question occurs is how would she say that we can use the imagination in general or art in particular to reconcile this distance um, or this alienation that we have from the natural world? Well, thank you, Jeanette. That's such a, a great question. Uh, uh, so, Ka so, so Cavendish thinks in a way that uh, imagination and this kind of reflective thinking that we can do, uh, imagination is a kind of double-edged sword she thinks, right? Where we can re retreat from the present that we're in and we can think and imagine things and sort of we can be at a distance from the natural world, maybe not function it so well. So sometimes she thinks that there's a kind of negative connotation that comes with the use of imagination. I think she thinks that uh, probably a lot of uh, non-human creatures uh, do not employ imagination in the same way that, that we do. Uh, but what's really interesting, and your question is, is hitting at this, is she also thinks that where uh, a certain thing can be a kind of curse, it can also be a blessing. And so I think she would say that imagination maybe can be one of the uh, tools at our disposal that, that, that saves us. Uh, in her own life, one of the things that she did, right? she was writing in the 17th century. She wanted to be a number of things. She wanted to be a philosopher. She wanted to be a scientist, a mathematician a military general, that was one of her goals. Uh, she knew though, it wasn't gonna happen, right? It wasn't gonna happen, not because she couldn't come up with really smart military strategies. She did actually, and she wrote about them, uh, but because of uh, reasons of gender discrimination, right? nobody was gonna take seriously an order that she would give as a military general if she was one. No one would train her to be a military general and, and she wouldn't become part of an army. So one of the things that she did, <laughs> And she thought, oh, she thought, okay, the world as it is isn't so great. So I'm going to use my imagination to think of an alternate way the world might be. And she used her imagination basically to create alternate universes or alternate worlds where things were different that would, um, where these alternate worlds would amount to a kind of picture for us of how we could change our own world for the better. So she wrote of worlds where uh, women were, they, they'd take a boat to the North Pole and they'd go through a kind of uh, portal and they'd end up on another planet somewhere. In some cases, I'm pretty sure it's Cavendish who's going through the portal. Uh, and in one of the stories called Blazing World, uh, she ends up on another planet and she, uh, and she uh, meets these individuals uh, 
and they ask her about her views in science and math, and she can't believe it. And she says, okay, I'll, I'll talk about that. And she talks to them and they listen to her and they want to learn from her and they debate with her. And she's wrong about some stuff, but that's fine. And she, but she corrects them about some stuff. And uh, she ends up having a very high profile position on this other planet. She becomes the military leader actually on the planet and she saves the day. Uh, so she's thinking that we can use imagination to paint the kind of picture of an alternate way that the actual world might be and then use that picture as a guide. Uh, I, I suspect if she were here today, uh, she, she would say that uh, it would be important to write stories and imagine stories where maybe we stand toward nature differently uh, and then use some of those stories as a kind of guide. I think in her time, I, I doubt she would have imagined some of the stuff that we're now technologically able to do to the environment. And so she probably wasn't worried much about uh, environmental issues, not like I think she would be today. I think she would say, sure, let's use art, let's use imagination to enable ourselves to picture how things might be different and use them as a source of inspiration to try to get there. So I've been um, thinking about Ginny's question and sort of to take it to the Figgy Art Museum itself and what you actually just said. Uh, David, thank you for that. And um, by the way, thanks to the museum for putting this together. It's really been remarkable for us to learn from each other and um, to be here with you. But I was thinking about how, um, you know, my sort of human conscious analytical mentality plans these exhibitions, you know, diagrams and AutoCAD and um, counting threads and ordering material and so on. But when the thread begins to go back and forth between space, it really, for me, and then hopefully for the museum goer and the visitor, um, begins to add up some add up to something that you can't really name, that I can't really analyze. Like, I think I know the internal structure, but it's really thread in the air. And as you say, the, the spaces and cells and atoms and energy between the threads is actually what's been built. The thread is like the conduit to get there in some ways. So I think it's really a sort of Cavendish idea, maybe a minute little piece of it. <laughs> um, but what I think has been remarkable to witness in these installations, and I understand it's happening at the Figgy, is that cell phones go in pockets and people either become silent or they begin to exhibit a kind of bodily uh, response or physiological response. So my question, aside from saying all that, is sort of, do you think that Cavendish would embrace this notion that the body can get us there, that our physiological response can get us more in tune with our inner mentality or our, our more animal mentality or river mentality, which I think is sort of the goal that Ginny and I had, was that something of the exhibit would get us there for a moment. I, I, I think she really does. Uh, uh, so uh, th there's no question, I think she would admit that there are some things we human beings can do that the non-animal creatures can't do. She doesn't want to deny that. That would be, that would be silly. Uh, and so certain kinds of planning, certain kinds of uh, uh, things that you mentioned, right? Th these are helpful tools in a human life. Uh, but she also seems to be thinking that there's a kind of intelligence and wisdom uh, into which we can tap uh, that is not like that. And that's where a lot of the real creativity happens in a human life. Uh, she didn't use this kind of example, of course, but I, I, I sometimes think of, of, um, of, of a late night comic, a, a late night talk show host, right? Who's, who's sitting there in front of the room. And if they try to, my understanding is that if they try to think too much or try to think, you know, be funny, it's going to backfire. They'll become too self-conscious. Instead, there's a kind of inspiration into which they tap, and they think funny things. There's a kind of magic that happens. And Cavendish is thinking there's a kind of bodily intelligence that kicks in at mm -hmm. certain moments. It's not a matter of deliberating or conscious thinking. So we, we come up with the right idea at the right time. Uh, so she's thinking, absolutely, there's a kind of embodied intelligence that's not reflective and not highly conscious that's going to help us out. And she's, she's going to say more generally that uh, the, the natural world uh, is made up out of, out of atoms right, and elemental bodies. 
And she's thinking that's really all there is, right? What exists is elemental bodies and then the larger things that are made up out of those elemental bodies, the elements of the periodic table and then larger things like us. All that there really is is just physical stuff. And that's all we are. Hmm. I think what she wants to highlight though is that the physical stuff that exists is really amazing and sophisticated. And we need to recognize that and tap into it. At the time that she wrote, uh, there was a, a kind of dualism that, that was very common. And it's still, some people believe it now, and it's a perfectly plausible view. Uh, the view that human beings are made on the one hand of bodies, and on the other hand, we're made of a mind. And they're two very different kinds of stuff. And our mind is the more exalted kind of special half of us or special part of it. The time that Cavendish is writing, what a lot of philosophers would say is to lead the best human life, you need to turn away from the body, turn away from this thing that holds us back and reflect mm -hmm. and be intellectual and tap into our spiritual side. That's the best sort of life to lead. What Cavendish is arguing is no, right? uh, really all that we are is a body, but that's not a negative result or a depressing result. Once you recognize that bodies are these wonderful, amazing things, right, and that cells can think and exhibit sophisticated behavior, that ants and spiders are intelligent, but there's a lot of intelligence in the natural world, she's going to say that we can recognize that we are fully embodied creatures, and we need to own our embodiment and tap into our embodied intelligence. And then she seems to think sky's the limit at that point. Mm. Mm. That's a great question. Mm. Well, I... Uh... Ginny, do you mind if I have a comment about your poem? <laughs> uh, <laughs> to take this sort of notion, I mean, I, I think each of us have our uh, analytical and uh, conscious mentality, and we seek seek the Cavendish mentality. But you know, Ginny, I, those of you who've seen the exhibition, her poem "Think Like the River" in its original form is a compact block of text. Uh, she uses a stick, as she calls it, to separate the so-called fragments or pieces of the poem or parts of the poem. Um, but when it began to be an element in the exhibition, um, and knowing that that wall was sort of her canvas of sort, she chose to take this compact body, if you will, or block, and scatter it or cast it or let it be influenced by the mentality of the river or the energy of the river and cast the fragments across the wall, you know, spanning 30 feet. Um, so that not only it's as though the language has its own mind and can reorder itself. And then the viewer, of course, can choose to start anywhere in that uh, array, if you will. Um, so I feel, I feel like, um, there's some Cavendish there in that wall. <laughs> I'm just wondering what you think about that, Ginny. <laughs> well, I want to thank you because had it not been for your invitation to collaborate on this, that poem would never have been liberated. And thank David again for giving Cavendish, you know, the framework of Cavendish to put it all in because, um, I think that the, the poem is much more true to itself for having mm -hmm. the opportunity to scatter across the wall than it was when it was in its original block form. Um, and I also wanna turn back to your work um, because we've been talking about the thread piece and I just wanna reiterate how my personal experience of that piece is to absolutely be freed from the kind of thinking that I think we, it, it's not an analytical experience. I hope that most of you or all of you have seen it or will be able to because um, when you enter into that piece and you really do enter into it, I think that you experience the kind of embodied intelligence that Cavendish describes. Um, it's quite remarkable. I think it is, it really changes the, the, we are changed when we are in that, in the presence of that work mm -hmm. in a way that I think Cavendish would, would be excited by, I hope. <laughs> well, for something to be that beautiful, I can't create anything nearly that beautiful, for something to be as beautiful as, as the, 
as the, uh, as the art exhibit uh, and also the poem. Uh, I think Cavendish might say something like that um, a human being sometimes gets into a kind of zone, right? So athletes use that metaphor, right? being in the zone where you tap into something. Uh, and and it's, it's very powerful. Uh, it's a kind of uh, a creative uh, skill and ability. Um, but it's, it, it, it arises, I think Cavendish would say, uh, when it comes to uh, very impressive productions like, like artworks. I think she would say it also arises in other contexts as well. Uh, things like, uh, for me, th these are maybe somewhat trivial cases, but when I go to the supermarket and I'm trying to remember my a member number for the local co-op, if I try <laughs> to think too hard about what the number is, I'll forget it. I'm not gonna remember it. So I just try to distract myself and look the other way, and then the number comes to me, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's not the same thing, but it's something like that, right? It's, it, it's a way to tap into some work that our bodies and our brains can do uh, for us. Uh, and it's not that I was consciously thinking the member number the whole time, it's that I desperately tried to consciously think of it and I couldn't think of it. And that's when I sort of relaxed and waited and it came. And Cavage is gonna say a lot of stuff is like that. A lot of the best ideas that people have kind of eureka moments, she would say, uh, there are ways in which the brain is kind of working behind the scenes and makes us come to have the idea. It's, it's a kind of magic. And in the case of creativity and other sorts of uh, uh, aspects of human life, I think she would say, uh, what we need to do is, uh, uh, we can't maybe consciously choose to try to get into that zone uh, and force it, because maybe that would backfire, but maybe create the conditions that make it more likely that we'll enter the zone. Or maybe when we're around others, create the conditions that make it more likely that the zone will be entered by the, the folks around us. So I feel like it, it I, I feel like I wanna say that Cavendish was sort of an early, early environmentalist of sorts, if you wanna say it that way. I mean, it seems um, she made him out of a thought of it that way, but if I take us to our contemporary times and think about how probably many people in the audience have had firsthand experience with the mighty Mississippi and it's, um, you know, the recent flooding and uh, devastation and difficulty with cropland and, you know, water lapping all up against the side of the figgy. I understand that, you know, the river sending us a message. Um, so it goes to this sort of, if we pay attention or if we think like the river, we can learn from that. Um, if we think ourselves as part of a larger, the whole of nature, um, we can maybe more readily learn from the river. Um, so it just seemed worth recognizing that the Figgy Art Museum is located where it is and that the exhibition in some ways came to be because of that relationship. Um, and now has been really, re this whole thought has been so reinforced by Cavendish's ideas. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, she has quite a respect for what she calls natural bodies and natural creatures. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would describe herself walking around her yard, just uh, appreciating and staring at things. And, and uh, I, I think she would uh, say that if we uh, could take care of the natural world a, a bit better, um, it, it would be good just for its own sake. I think she would, it would be good for its own sake, she would say. But the paradox is that it would also be in a way a matter of self-interest, right? We'd be in a more sustainable situation. Uh, she thinks that uh, the environment all includes uh, what we normally regard as the natural world, but also includes other human beings, she would say, right? Because we're all made of the same stuff. We're all made of the same, she would say, highly sophisticated stuff. So she would also worry that there's all kinds of respects in which a lot of the talents and abilities and creativity of many human beings maybe just aren't being tapped in the right sort of way. And if we could somehow harness that in the same way that she would want the talents of women in the 17th century to be harnessed to become military generals and such, we'd just be on a different, we'd be an entirely different planet. Um, she even suggests in one, she suggests something in one place, like you know, imagine if uh, starting in the 17th century, or uh, starting earlier than that, in the 15th century, uh, women were able to go to get training and go to college and do all the same sorts of things that men would be able to do. Uh, imagine what the impact would be in terms of uh, innovations in science, uh, 
fields like dentistry, and maybe there'd be a cure for cancer or something now, right? If the best minds are working on all this stuff. And said she's worried that uh, right now it's maybe the top 20% of the guys who are working on it. Uh, what if it was the top 5% of the, of the men and the women working on it? We'd be living in a different planet. She sees all of it as a kind of totality that needs to be nurtured and, and we'd be in a different place. So we maybe should turn to questions, but I had one thing I wanted to say that totally connects to what you just said. Um, there's a remarkable parallel in Cavendish's uh, history as a woman thinker to an, a Swedish artist who worked at the turn of the century, Hilma af Klint, who some of you may know. There's a fantastic exhibition at the Guggenheim several years ago, just before the pandemic. And she also, didn't expect her contemporaries to understand her work. Um, in her case, she, um, you know, did say her her work was much more metaphysical and spiritual than Cavendish, as a scientist. But um, they each had a, a a discussion in their work of the relationship to, between the human and nature um, in slightly different ways. But uh, Clint uh, asked her heirs, uh, I think her nephew was the person who inherited her estate, to keep her work secret for 20 years and not to release it until 20 years later, which of course is now almost 100 years later that it's getting mass attention. Um, and really her the, the staging of her work in contemporary uh, art discourse now is completely rewriting the history of abstraction. She her because her work predated Kandinsky and many of the people, uh, men who were <laughs> uh, noted as being the originators of abstraction. So there's a remarkable parallel in the sort of mind of that woman and how uh, society understood their place. And of course, there are many many other stories, color theorists and others. So it's wonderful. There's such an archive. Right, yeah, such a, yes, that's a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, uh, great. So now uh, perhaps we could turn it over to uh, any questions from the audience. I'd love to hear any thoughts that the folks might have. So the, the question is, uh, uh, when did Cavendish cultivate a readership? Uh, mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, that's a great question. So it, it, it um, did she have followers in her time as well? Uh, mm -hmm. So. Uh, she um, uh, she had some notoriety in her time, and people knew that she was trying to become established as a writer. But during her own lifetime, she didn't get very much attention. She got very little attention, and she was even mocked in in many circles by unfortunately by influential people. Unfortunately, there was a poem by Virginia Woolf that kind of sealed the deal against Cavendish. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but 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 she, she she had a sort of modest following, I think, in the uh, in the nineteenth century. Uh, but as, as a literary as a literary writer, uh, so it, she wrote in different areas. She she was a, a playwright, she was a poet. She wrote short stories and science fiction, and she also wrote uh, philosophical texts. The philosophical texts got no attention of any kind. Maybe that's an <laughs> almost no attention of any kind uh, until maybe 30 years ago. Uh, and then a, a, a wonderful scholar, Eileen O'Neill, she was a distinguished professor at UMass Amherst, wrote a paper called Disappearing Ink, the story of the women whose work was would have been impactful if it had just been read, but the ink was disappearing and we need to we need to read these folks and recover them. Uh, since then, uh, a, there were a few pieces in the 20th century on her philosophical work. Uh, since then, there's been an explosion in Cavendish studies. And part of it is just that somehow it, it's gotten out there. The people are, are writing on her and thinking about her. When she scoops, so she anticipates the views of the men who come after her. And when she does that, it's really hard for people not to pay attention to her, right? Clearly, she's onto something. And it kind of embarrasses some of the philosophers in the profession, right? You say, how come we haven't been paying attention to her? It's also exciting, I think, to read this 
voice who's now fresh, even though she wrote 350 years ago. So in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, she, she's made a huge splash in philosophy, uh, in uh, English literature. Um, throughout the 20th century, she was getting more and more well-known. Well, such a great question. Did she ever talk about God or the soul? And did she get in trouble with the church? So how is she going to handle this? Um, um, so, so one thing she wants to say uh, is uh, she thinks that human beings actually can have no idea of God, no idea of any kind of God. We can't think of God because God's supposed to be so magnificent that our little minds couldn't possibly capture what God is. So that's one way she tries to get out of the, 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 the controversy is say, I'm so humble and pious that I don't even think we can have an idea of the majesty of this being. And then she critiques her opponents and says, you think a human mind can really contain a kind of idea of God? So that's one, one direction she had. She says, we can't talk about God and, and nobody can. But the other thing that she says, that's really interesting is she says, um, uh, she says the minds that we uh, have as human beings, the minds that we notice when we think of a cat or a dog, or we plan to do something during our day, the minds that we have, she says, we know that those minds are just material, physical things. Those minds are just material, our ideas are material, physical things. The way we know that, she says, just a couple reasons. One, she says, our minds are able to interact with our bodies. Our minds can budge our bodies. You can decide for your arm to go up and it goes up. It's like, how would that happen? Her thought is that if your mind was a totally non-physical thing, it was like a ghost-like non-physical thing, you could choose for your arm to go up but your decision would just go right through your arm. It wouldn't be able to budge it or nudge it because it doesn't have a, an, an edge or a surface or a, or a point of contact. Uh, so she thinks that the fact that our minds and bodies interact is proof or evidence that our minds are physical. She also points to things like uh, the consumption of alcohol, right? They can have such an impact on our thinking. It's like if, if, our, if our minds were not physical, presumably there wouldn't be that kind of impact. I don't think it's her best argument, but but it's one that she cites. And she says things like that we know our minds move from place to place. Like when she's on the carriage from Oxford to London, she's thinking in Oxford. Then she's thinking when she's on the carriage in the next town over, then she's thinking all the way to, to, to London. She says, that means my mind is traveling with me. Hmm. But that means minds move. Minds partake of a kind of motion. But the only things that move are bodies because they have to have a location to go from one place to the next. So she offers arguments like that. And then what she says is the minds that we are trying to uncover and understand when we do this philosophical work, we know those are physical. They aren't some immaterial, non-physical soul. But then she would add, maybe there's a thing that is a non-physical soul. But if there is, we can't talk about it or think about it or come into contact with it in any way. Uh, we just have to stay silent, sort of like how we have to stay silent about God. Yeah, it's a great question. But she anticipated, she was so worried about this, right? Because the first question often, right, if she's publishing her work is, are you some kind of horrible atheist, right? Who thinks that, that we don't have a soul? So she tells an elaborate story. And she also tells a story about how She's, uh, she thinks there's a kind of religion that people can have where, um, th th um, how to describe it. Um, um, sh sh she has a lot of really nasty things to say about organized religion, I'll put it that way. And she says that, she says that human beings are self-interested, horrible creatures and she thinks they use organized religion in really nasty ways to be able to say that God wants me to do this horrible thing, so I have the right to do it. So she really knocks organized religion. But then she'll say things like, but if we're talking about actual God, we need to say great things about God, but also realize that God's so majestic, we can't describe whatever that is. Yeah. Well, thank you for your question. Yeah, so, so, so the question is about uh, science fiction, 
and about how Cavendish seems to be engaging in, uh, in, in the, she seems to be producing science fiction. And it's a long time ago, right? So, so what's the timeline here? Uh, so uh, I, I don't know how strong a case I can make. Uh, I like to, to say that, uh, that uh, Cavendish was at least the first English nonfiction writer. I know Frankenstein, of course, is often cited as the first piece of science fiction, but I, 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 this come, uh, her, Cavendish's piece, The Blazing World, comes before Frankenstein. And in The Blazing World, this is the piece where the woman is uh, on a boat to the North Pole and she goes through the portal and ends up on the other planet. Uh, in that piece, uh, part of her military strategy is to create uh, boats that go underwater so the enemy can't see them, basically submarines. Uh, it's wonderful. She creates all these devices in her fiction that don't exist. Uh, and then I tried to look back on the history. Who was the first person to ever sketch a submarine? And apparently there's a big debate about this. Maybe somebody did sketch it a long time ago in Roman times, but if you look at the sketch, doesn't look much like a submarine to me. So these are debatable kinds of issues. But at the very least, she was a, a very early science fiction writer. And she thought science fiction was empowering because she would stare at the situation that she faced and say, this is no good. And she didn't want to just sort of eat it and accept it. That was undignifying. But she knew that she couldn't change the world from what it was because she didn't have the authority or power to do it. So she created these alternate worlds. And she invited other people, especially women, to join her in these alternate worlds or to create them herself, uh, sort of like the way that we get lost in a book sometimes. She would get lost in her imaginary worlds and, and she would be uh, um, uh, Margaret the First was one of the <laughs> imaginary worlds that she created where she was the, a, a leader of a different uh, country. Yeah. Well, thank you for your question. Well, it's such a great question, right? So the question is about uh, things like floods and natural disasters, if they would, um, it, it, to use her kind of language, right? She thinks that the bodies in nature are wise and they uh, are very productive and uh, sophisticated. Did they, in, in some cases, kind of combine together to maybe uh, create a flood, right? Or to do something, sometimes it might even be destructive. Uh, so there are, so there, there are instances where she, does talk about uh, some of the ways in which uh, creatures are cruel to each other, like how a, a bear might just go and eat something and tear it up slowly, another living thing. She talks about that kind of case. And so she doesn't want to paint a picture according to which uh, the, the animals in nature are like from a Disney movie or something, right? And they're all getting along really well. She recognizes that there are some things that happen that, that, are, that are bad and problematic. One of the things that she says, she does register that there are uh, some things of that sort that happen. One of the things that she says in those contexts, I don't know if this gets her into trouble, but this is interesting, let's think about it. One of the things she says is that uh, when we uh, identify something as a natural disaster, it's, it's partly due to our parochial and self-interested perspective, it's that, uh, we're upset because maybe our shelters have been destroyed or something that interests us has been destroyed. Whereas there's a larger point of view from which we can say that nature is uh, updating itself. <laughs> nature is being active and, and growing and developing and maybe regenerating and, and trying to see what happens. And so I think what she would say is that in a lot of cases, the things that we identify as really problematic from a non-human perspective, we could say they're actually quite beautiful and wonderful. Uh, but there's a kind of worry that arises about cases that seem uh, you know, pretty vicious and a whole species gets wiped out, <laughs> what she would say in that case. I'm not sure she can stand on it, the, the same kind of ground. It's a great question. Thank you. Dan and Jenny, can you hear that? A little can bit. You hear the question? Yeah, they're, they're the, the, the exhibit is brilliant. And, and uh, when you enter the exhibit, uh, the, you're washed over by the, the power of the art. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so thank you. Good, good. So, she, so she's, 
she's got to walk a fine line here, right? Absolutely. Uh, so so uh, there are a couple of points that are coming up in the question, a couple of points that are really important. One is that uh, there are uh, people before the time of Cavendish who had the view that uh, nature is to be admired and exhibits a kind of sophistication and such. And you pointed to some Native American communities and other societies. Uh, absolutely. So she's, I think, uh, in terms of the Western tradition, uh, she's trying to defend a view like this. And she's working against the grain of her time. But you're right, there are others who defended a similar view before her. Uh, in, in terms of whether, and then another question was, whether or not Cavendish is anthropomorphizing, right? Uh, hmm. uh, so let me say one more thing about your, the first question too. Uh, I think what she would say is, uh, she, I think she would admit that she's uh, making some points that other folks have probably made, even though I don't think she had read any of those folks. But she's trying to make an intervention in Western and European philosophy, which she thinks is just sending us totally down the wrong road, where the view is that what the human self is, is something like the thinking mind, the rational mind, the deliberative mind. It's a really predominant view in the period in which she's writing. And so she's doing everything she can to try to take, she's doing everything that she can to try to take on that view. But it definitely isn't original, it's not original to her. Uh, so, so maybe a better way to put her view right, um, is to say that uh, she thinks that natural bodies are intelligent and wise and sophisticated and capable. I'm trying to leave out words like good. <laughs> Because I have this, I, I, I appreciate the worry that you have. Uh, I think what she's trying to do is, is, is say that uh, as a kind of habit, we, or at least the period, in, the people in her time period, look around at the natural world and we really dismiss it. We think it's not very impressive. It's not capable of doing very much stuff. We think that we are the wise ones who know how to do things and have all the power and ability. And in a way, this goes back to, you know, this, Plato probably ruined it for everybody, she would say. Plato makes this distinction between bodies on the one hand and minds on the other. And he equates bodies with death and inactivity. They're the lowest grade of, of stuff, right? Uh, they're just so lousy. And so part of what Cavendish is trying to do is say no, right? Uh, bodies are, are pretty sophisticated and intelligent and amazing. Um, does that mean they're good? I think she might say, well, when we use words like good and bad, we're probably just tracking our reactions to those things and how they make us feel and our judgments about them. What happens in nature is just what happens and what happens next and what happens next. But I think she wants to say is there's there's a kind of language we can use to describe the natural world where we're not using words like good or bad, but we're still highlighting that it's a lot more capable and smart and wise than people have taken it to be in the past. And I think since we identify those as good things, maybe we might add, okay, so nature has a lot of good qualities. But I think she might try to limit herself to just the claim that nature is wise and smart and resourceful and try to hold off on some of the, the value language. I think that's a really good point. Yeah, and I, I so if I, if I left that impression, I, 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 I should retreat. If I left that impression, I should retreat a little bit. I think what, what she would say is that uh, um, there's a way that we dismiss and, uh, and, and, and nature and, and think that nature isn't particularly uh, capable or sophisticated. And then she would remind us, no, let's look at all the things that natural bodies can do. They can do all kinds of sophisticated stuff. In some cases, they can do things that we can't. And then I think she might add, not sure this would sneak in the, the value language. She might add that if we do recognize that and we follow nature's lead, we'll actually be happier and more content 
and uh, more strong as individuals and as a species. We'll be better off in the sense that we'll be happier. But I think that could still allow her to not use the value language. Right? She might say, well, is it good that human beings are happy? She might say, well, it's not good or bad. It's just what it is. But I think she's trying to offer us guidance. If we really do want to be happy, we better follow the lead of these wise creatures that surround us. I think if she were here, she would say we definitely have had an impact on the natural world. And, and we have uh, maybe in some cases strained nature so that it's not as able to do the wise things that it has always been able to do. And she would say that. She would say that we will be better off if we slow down and try to uh, imitate nature and, and change a lot of our ways. Um, what's striking to me in, 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 the, in the context of the, the, the point about whether uh, any of, would Cavendish say that climate change is bad? Right, so, um, My, my speculation <laughs> is that she would say uh, what, uh, that, uh, what there is in nature is a bunch of bodies that are sophisticated and smart and they can do all kinds of stuff. Um, there's one passage where she talks about whether there's anything good or bad that happens in the natural world. And she says, no. She says, good or bad are just terms that we use you know, to describe things that we like, things that we don't like. So I think this is a kind of offshoot of her larger view of the elemental bodies that make up the universe. Her view is that the universe is made up basically the, ele the elements of the periodic table, but she thinks that those elements also think and are perceptive. The basic elements that make up everything are intelligent and they combine into more intelligent, sophisticated bodies. If you ask her, do the elements of the periodic table have features like good or bad? I think she would say no. Um, elements of the periodic table have features like atomic weight, some kind of size or shape or motion, intelligence and the perception, she would say. They don't have features like, there is no good or bad in nature, she would say. She would say that um, those elements then couldn't combine together into something like good or bad either. Nature is just a bunch of stuff that happens and unfolds. I think that's her official view, but she's writing from the human perspective. So she still wants to retain words like good and bad. So she wants to say things like, it's bad when we do this stuff to nature because we're destroying stuff that is really smart and wise and sophisticated. And if we lived in unison with it, we'd all be better off as a totality. Um, I think she'd kind of retreat a little bit from saying anything about whether nature is good or bad. Um, good, good. So, uh, uh, so a question is about uh, whether Cavendish is in, is in some way separating human beings, human creatures from the rest of nature, insofar as she'll sometimes use words like good and bad to describe the situations of human beings. Uh, but she doesn't think there's any such thing as good or bad in nature. There's just stuff that happens, nature, the natural world unfolding. So I think what she'll say is um, she's got to be careful. She's got she's to describe it just right. She wants to say what there is in nature is ants, spiders, crocodiles, um, the elements that make up ants, spiders, crocodiles, and bees, also human beings. Uh, and those human beings uh, have desires, right? but those are all natural physical things that form in the human being as a result of their evolution and their, their brain. Uh, and she would say that human beings are a part of nature. And one of the things that we do as human beings 
is we create, we use words like good and bad to express when our situation is uh, um, amenable to, to our needs, right? When our situation is working for us. So she would say that she's, she thinks she's not separating human beings from the rest of nature because we're all physical things. It's just that human beings have been able to create language to label things good and bad that suit them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. So I want to thank you all for coming. And I want to thank David, Anne, and Jenny for being here tonight. I know we all probably have tons more questions and we've been given a lot of homework. I think we all have to go read all of Margaret Cavendish's writings now. Um, but if you do have further questions for David, Ann, or Jenny, please feel free to reach out to me and I will distribute those questions to them and get you answers. Maybe not all to all the questions in the universe, but we'll get what we can. Um, and I do want to encourage you, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, they're unfortunately going to kick us out of the building in about 10 minutes because the museum closes at 8, but rush up there if you can make it to the fourth floor in 10 minutes, you know, more power to you. But if not, come back before September 4th and do see it. I also, in speaking of homework, I do ask you if you haven't filled out one of the uh, Humanities Iowa evaluation forms about the program tonight, it would help us out greatly if you could just leave those on the table there or hand them to me directly. Otherwise, thank you again so much for coming and thanks David and Ann and Jenny for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.